Welcome to the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies, where there's always another secret. Hello everybody, what's it doing, what's happening? Welcome back to a hopefully much better sounding episode of the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies. Today is December 10th, 2018, and we are recording episode 20, where we will be finishing our discussion in the latest entry in Mistborn Era 2, The Bands of Mourning. I am Bill, and I am joined, as always, by my divine co-hosts, Amy <laughs> and Jordan. Welcome, oh, guys. You. Thank I don't you. get to be a whisper anymore. Yay. Yeah, I have to say, uh, both of you sound really good. Have you two been working out? You know, well, I... you know, I, I have been doing some vocal <laughs> exercises. So. La, 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 la. Except this cold is really not helping me at all. But, you know. <laughs> oh, boy. So for those of you who may be wondering, Amy and I both got new mics. And so hopefully it sounds better. If it doesn't, then that's going to be the most ironic introduction <laughs> ever. It's so. going to be so sad. Yeah, no, there's, there's no way that uh, ever uh, bites us in the butt. We never have audio no. issues. Oh, yeah. Never. It's, it's, it's great. No issues whatsoever. I mean, it's, never, it's not like there's an entire episode where I was just silent. <laughs> Listen, you were feeling particularly devout that day. You took a vow of silence. And, you know, <laughs> and Amy and I had a weirdly disjointed conversation about where the whole thing. Where we just thing. randomly you know, start talking about things that no one else hears. The weirder part is that it, for the most part, kind of worked. It did kind of work. <laughs> Which says a lot about my commentary, I think, well, that I'm not adding as much as I'd like. Well, especially <laughs> since it actually cut down on time by half. Ooh, that was a wake-up call. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. Well, for those of you who listen to the podcast recordings or are watching the video on YouTube, we just want to remind you that if you'd like... You can actually join and interact with us live via the chat as we record each episode at www.twitch.tv slash innkeepers table. Uh, we record episodes of the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies every other Monday night, starting at 7.30 Pacific Time, 10.30 p.m. Eastern. So please join us, take an active part of the discussion, and let us know how we're doing. Chime in, raise extra, you know, exciting points that we may have missed. Um point out when and we're you know hypocritical and all that no don't Double point standards. out when we're hypocritical <laughs> only tell us good things because we like positive reinforcement negative reinforcement mm. psh, that's overrated the parent in me says mm. <laughs> you can't tell me uh. what to do you're not my real dad <laughs> the the youngest child in me says tell me everything i want to hear so <laughs> <sighs> Uh, now, just so people know, um, our next episode is going to re release on our normal schedule, but we're actually going to be recording it a bit early because we have family and friends that we would like to visit with over the holiday week, you know, for Christmas and and joyous gatherings. So if mm -hmm. but if you want to join us for that recording, that is going to be this Sunday at the same time, 730 p.m. Pacific, 1030 p.m. Eastern. And we will actually be discussing a book that you may not know about, but hopefully, you, if you're listening, then you'll, you're <laughs> fairly aware. Mistborn's Secret History. And if you haven't read it, read it now. Secret. It's, it's little, so it shouldn't take you terribly long. It's very yeah. short, but it's wonderful because it yes. has so many amazing things. Um, now, as a reminder to those of you who may just be tuning in, we are devoting an episode or two or three or four, depending on how long the book is, to each episode and discussing the storyline, different themes that we like, how it fits into the Cosmere. Once we've finally gone through everything that Brandon's written, which will probably be around a little bit past the year mark of when we started the podcast, uh, that's when we're going to start diving into the aluminum foil hat theories, getting into the nitty gritty, picking apart, looking at magic systems specifically and comparing them and all sorts of crazy discussions. So uh, if there's anything in particular you want us to talk about, though, 
please feel free to write us. You can uh, send us an email at studies at gmail.com. Now, we also want to remind people, if you haven't read all of the Mistborn books, there are going to be spoilers this episode. Mm -hmm. It's going to happen because this is the last book so far in the series. And we can't really discuss what's going on in this book <laughs> without discussing what went on in those books. Yeah. So um, if we talk about anything outside the Mistborn series, we'll try to give you a spoiler warning. Um, no promises, but we will we'll do what we can. So. So, yeah. Um, so back to Wax and Wayne and Marasi and, and Steris. Steris and Milan. And Milan, who is one of my absolute favorite She's so fun. characters. She's just delightfully <laughs> Milan. <laughs> Enigmatic. It's an so, amazing descriptor. <laughs> okay, so where do we want to start? Do we just want to take it from the beginning and just go step by step through the plot? Or are there certain I know points we have the notes from last into? time that we didn't we go do. over, but they, so kind I went, of, they bop around a little bit. Right. I think, yeah. So I don't I, know. If... It's. I mean, that's sort of how these second episodes tend to go. Is there anything we we want to cover from the uh, the village at all? <sighs> I I have one thing I want to say. Okay. It, it deals with his sister because we find out that you know she's sequence, and that she's mm -hmm. the one who ends up recruiting Edward and all this stuff. I found the once you know that you read that chapter a bit bit differently because the mm -hmm. fact that she stays even after the horrible thing that happens in the village and doesn't go with uh with wax uh tells right. a lot and i think specifically what it tells her is like why she stayed i think she realized wow they don't watch us very closely here so mm -hmm. i can get I, away with things i think she realized that high society would be harder for her to to do what she wanted, that it would be more mm -hmm. constrictive. I'm not saying she was part of, you know, the set already and already had all these plans, but just her natural mm -hmm. affinity for not doing what she's told. Right. It seemed to me she wanted to stay in the village for that reason. Yeah. I mean, cause we find out that wax has always been kind of abide by the rules. I am a lawman yeah. and she, we find out wasn't. Yeah. It was interesting to say the Indeed. least. Mm -hmm. But no, and it, it's just it's an interesting look also at terrorist society, modern terrorist society, modern yeah. for this era, Mistborn era two terrorist society. Just because, especially when you contrast it with what you knew was the case before, and then you look mm -hmm. at it and see how they've taken some things and like stretched them and made other things bigger deals and less thing, you know. Right. So. It's it's just it's an interesting well, especially because the, the terrorist society in era one, was very. It felt a lot more exotic. Mm -hmm. Um. And Which is strange, given that they're more common now. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, and it's it if it, it's interesting because it feels. It had a much more, Southeast Asian, feeling to it, like Indian and Tibetan, okay, and that that, that that region, and this era it almost feels more Native American. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's as much, through our american eyes or if it's or if other people in other countries think the same thing it's it's very possible. i'm, I'm I curious know. about that because i mean i i have been to japan but i don't see everything through their viewpoint either so well i i was talking more along the the indian subcontinent well well i i know but i mean i an eastern right view versus me being very much got it the got West. it oh so that, but, that i haven't sense. i haven't been to india so i didn't feel like i right. should talk about that mm-hmm so. And, I, and I haven't been, I've done a very cursory, you know, readings on a few things, but nothing mm -hmm. in depth by any means. Yeah. And so, but I'm just saying that's sort of the, the flavor that I got. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree. I just, I'm curious if anybody else has a mm -hmm. very different viewpoint that, on that. That's an interesting thought. So. Yeah. I, the other thing that's interesting about how they're portrayed is, uh, 
is the fact that they're they're very much concerned sort of in a they're concerned about mixing the powers because of how right. dangerous the lord ruler was and how dangerous the ro- lord ruler was for them specifically mm-hmm. but at the same time it's so insulated that they are refusing to acknowledge the problems they have in their society. Right. Yeah. And and so they end up, even though they're surrounded literally by everyone else, because they're just in the middle of Elendel, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They, they refuse to accept that, yeah, we have these problems too. And they sort of want to pretend that, oh, this is all just, uh, like, anything that bad that happens is you guys have brought your weapons of yeah. death in here. Yeah, your and tame, it's like, your weapons of death and everything. Right. Yeah, and I think that's what was a big deal for Wax was seeing firsthand that no evil exists everywhere. For him, where he, you know, he's a lawman and he sees things that way, mm-hmm. it makes sense that he suddenly realizes, yeah, it doesn't matter where I go. There's going to be... Uh, Somebody who's doing there's something. There's going to be bad apples. Right. Yeah. No, very true. And that was a very scary bad apple. Yeah, but... yeah. Another thing I found interesting was this was the first time they dealt with uh, sort of the the big city versus the country. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we, we sort of got a little bit of that feel in Warbreaker between yeah. Teteller and uh, the other the other cities around oh, it. Right. Yeah. Where and Teteller Oster. sort of dominates <clears throat> everything. And, yeah. I mean, you look yeah. historically. That's a very common, uh, a common storyline of the big cities completely disjointed from the problems of the people who are not in the city. Yeah. Right. And so, yet there's a weird dependence on both sides from it, mm-hmm. and which leads to a lot of conflicts and ends up leading to a lot of war. And we see that playing out, and the set exploiting that. Per- mm-hmm. In uh, oh, what yeah. was the city's name? New Saren? New, New Saren. Ah, yeah. New Saren. Which, by the way, what a place to put a city right on top <laughs> of a conventicle where they were doing some really bad stuff. Yeah. But I don't know. I found that very interesting because he didn't really get to delve too deep into it because that was more of a subplot that got abandoned because Wax realized, well, if the set wants me to be distracted by this, then I need even, to do something else. Then I, I need to look even closer. Mm-hmm. That, that was one of my favorite things is when he's listening to his uncle talk about distracting him and he's just like huh well that won't work wait a second that would have worked if i hadn't been thinking in just the random other way and resisted well, it because he really wanted to chase the thieves yeah the, well and the then on robbers. top of it he's thinking of all the little nuggets he's been chasing in ellendale mm-hmm. thinking he's just one step closer and, and he's, he's suddenly like, realizing oh, no. I was totally distracted by everything. Right. I mentioned it last episode, but I just loved when he drops it here. And then his uncle's just making (laughs) fun of him. Oh, sorry, I couldn't be there to see it. I'm sure it was appropriately (laughs) dramatic. (laughs) Dramatic. Yes. Well, and that's much more fun than the other horrible (laughs) villains. Well, and that's the other fun thing is he knows Wax so well. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, Amy, you pointed this out in the in the notes. Yeah, Wax has grown beyond the. Like, but at the same time, he still Wax. He he still wants to do it, but he's like, no, I need to do the adult thing or the smart thing and not go on this little tangent. I need to focus on what actually matters. Exactly. Like you know, being a house lord is it is a house lord, right? Mm-hmm. Or yeah, anyway, but like doing yeah. all that stuff, he's like, I don't want to have to do that, and then. Later on in the train, actually, Steris gets him interested in doing the finances. <laughs> <laughs> it was like it was such a sweet little geeky moment. I know it was. <laughs> it was really cute, and like I think it's is it Marasi who walks in and is like, "What? What is going on? They've got papers scattered all over the thing, and they're excited about accounting." <laughs> it's like and, what and, is and, going on? Yeah, because because Wax is looking through, and suddenly he's like, "Aha! I found it. The last one. Is... The last chip." <laughs> <laughs> There's this little competition, and you're just like, mm-hmm. okay, I didn't like it in the first book, but I, I kind of ship it at this point. All right, I'll, I'll, yeah. all right, Brandon, you've convinced me. <laughs> yeah. Because, again, he did a sort of slow burn. You know, it yeah. wasn't just a, and suddenly they were in love. 
and there's the the, the rising music and there mm-hmm. you go but there were just they had several little moments and suddenly they realized hey mm-hmm. this works yeah they, they just... kind of grew their friendship as long as well as the romance and so right what was it there well, was a moment where he he went up above the clouds this is where the ascendance field or mm-hmm. whatever came in and right. he was testing the Renette's ball and chain ball and whatever chain. thing type thing and then he's up there with with Steris, who's loving every moment of it which he's like still surprises him that she's like i love being up in the heights with you or whatever else and he's like huh i really do like her and then he kisses her as they fall and i'm like oh oh my goodness that would just be like a heart melting moment right there except you know i i'm terrified of heights so i would have issues with that particular thing but mm-hmm. superman's theme plays in the background yeah uh, I also just, just love that it's called the Ascendance Field. Mm-hmm. Because that's her playground. Yep. Like ev- even more than the survivor, it's it's hers. Well, well it's because mm-hmm. even even though Kelsier was a Mistborn and taught her that this is yours, she's the one who ascended and sort of rose above it. Mm-hmm. Even more so than just a regular Mistborn did. Yeah. She became the Mist. Right. Mm-hmm. Which is metal, but uh, then again, you could say that a lot in Mistborn. A lot of things are metal, yeah, right. including Spe- the magic system. Speaking of th- those uh, ball and chains that you mentioned, can mm-hmm. we talk about those? What's the word they actually used for them? They weren't ball and chains. They were. It's almost Gra- a was grapple. it grappling, grappling hook, grapple. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna look up Renette's stuff. I think he just said spheres. I think he just referred to them as Renette spheres, but I'm not positive. Or orbs. I will find it. Some word for a three-dimensional round object. Uh, Godless Rebel says it was sphere and hook. Oh, okay. Thank you. Grappling hook. But it's just sort of a... <laughs> you know, it, it speaks to Renette's ingenuity and a little bit to Brandon's as well, because... He he likes exploring. Okay, so if this means this and this means this, how can I take this to its extended conclusion? Well, and it just starts ask. It makes you start to ask so many questions about pushing, where it's like, well, wait, I'm holding on to it, but I'm pushing away from it. Could if I pushed hard enough, could it make me fly if I did this? And you start trying to figure out how you're going to break physics. Uh huh. Um. Because they clearly can push hard enough to lift their own weight, because that's how they do things. Yeah. Right, but but, the but if they're pushing, it's pushing against them, and so. But it's also pulling against them. Right. It just, it, uh, yeah. No. <laughs> it it doesn't like that's the point. It it doesn't let you fly. Right. But it makes you start thinking about it right because even if you're pushing (laughs) gravity is still pulling on you and the push that you're pushing against it is also pushing you down so Mm. but yeah fun times fun fun times (laughs) but no the uh no to to truly break the game you have to start doing stuff with weight which he can do and it's just horribly unfair i just i i love that renette has essentially become wax's cue oh that's true yeah like she's the one who comes up with all the fun little gadgets, including the <laughs> the elephant gun that blasts Steris off the train. <laughs> that gun, oh my goodness, that rifle. The crasher just, gun, or I guess it'd be a skimmer gun. Anyone who can store weight could use it. Mm-hmm. Mm. But it's just, it, it's this concept of, okay, you know, it's not just what can you do with the magic, it's what can you do with the magic mixing it with mundane things. Yeah. Because so many times you just hear these authors Oh, he could cast a fireball. Well, now if somebody could create a fireball, how would that affect everyday life for that person? You know, and it's just yeah, it, it takes it to that next step. Mm. And so suddenly he has this engineer who creates new ways to to utilize it, and it's just a really fun concept because suddenly you have magic plus gadgets. Yeah. Try and- trying to remember what was there was a moment it was either against the giant coin shot guy who likes to fist fight uh-huh. or just verse I, or it might have been people taking cover and they're just like ready to do stuff oh no it was when he was fighting all those coin shots that were like on, on top of the ship like as they were escape oh. trying to escape mm-hmm. and like the other coin shot was like 
was waiting for him to shoot, you know, so it could deflect the bullet. And he had the, I just like calling it the elephant gun. That's a good word for it. <laughs> he has the what elephant gun. And the guy's getting ready to deflect, and he's just like, <laughs> no, you won't. <laughs> Good luck. It's just not going to work. It's like, and he's how just, hard like, can you push? <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, that is, that's not going to work at all. Mm-mm. It's it's all one of those, oh, you have the wrong idea about what's about to happen here. <laughs> It's like, that would be a very good idea, except for one small detail. <laughs> Just a little bit. Oh, mm. It's fun. I like I like Red Hat's guns. It really yeah. is. But no, okay, the, so- uh, as far as covering like stuff we missed last time, mm-hmm. one thing that I don't think we talked a lot about was, because we got a better look at Conjure Society, despite the mm-hmm. fact it wasn't focused on them. Yeah. Um, the fact that what dang it, what was the name of the Chandra that was showing them everything? Uh, oh v- goodness, v- Vendel. It's close to that. That's Vendel. Check. Sounds oh. right. But where he has Breeze's hands, Vendel. Okay. Yeah, Vendel. He has Breeze's hands. Oh, that's right, because he, was... he gifted them to him. Right. It like they. It makes perfect sense. Like I understand why it's disturbing to everyone else, but. Uh... The uh, they they treat body parts the same way we would treat tools or clothing. Yeah, it's because well, it, like, wanted... it almost feels like relics too mixed mm-hmm. in there. Yeah, yeah. And it's I just thought it was interesting where he asked Wayne like if he could have his skeleton when he was done because blood, blood makers. makers have very interesting bone structures because they're because always constantly re-knitting stuff. Breaking mm-hmm. and re-knitting and breaking and re-knitting. Yeah, I can't remember if Wayne says yes or if he's just creeped no, out. Wayne, no, Wayne was creeped out because he's like Wayne yeah, was he re- yells, wax? The Condra bloke's being creepy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he's being creepy again. Make him stop. Which, man, you have to be a special kind of creepy if you get Wayne <laughs> off his... Uh... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so that reminds me of, of, I can't remember, was it in the, on the YouTube channel we got the comment about us having a double standard? I think it was there. Uh Yes, yeah, somebody chimed in on YouTube. It was great. <laughs> yeah, and I, I realized even after, like, before I saw that comment, but after we finished recording, I was like, oh, wait. Yeah, we did kind of forget that Wayne, or Wax, was married to Lessie, who was a Chandra. But, yeah, it's too late to comment on it now. Again. To be fair, <laughs> Wax was not aware of any of yeah, this. Yeah, there, there was no consent on his part knowing that she was anything but human, whereas M- Milan and Wayne are very knowledgeable of what each other is. Right. But. So. So, we, the, what was it? Something else we didn't get to talk about might dominate the conversation once we get started. Is it my <laughs> thing? I don't know what's your thing. The, the thing with Steris in the train. Is Let's talk about Steris in the I train. I wasn't, but no, go ahead. So, okay, let me fix my sound, because apparently my sound is still too high. Yeah, Amy you're, is peaking a little bit. I'm trying not to. So we'll, we'll need down, to... We'll go down to 64. We'll try that. Okay. okay. <clears throat> so, being a woman, this was an interesting scene, because it's about Steris realizing that she doesn't know anything about sex. And she knows that that's going to happen. So she's trying to figure out what she should do. And the whole scene starts with her being very engrossed in a book. And there, I don't remember what the book is on the outside. <laughs> but she's doing the, the book inside the book thing. It's usually people are reading like comics or whatever else, but they don't have comics. And she's reading about that. And, and Wax like asks, asks her a question and she doesn't reply. And he's like, what? What is she so engrossed in? And like she, she, she comes out of the book and then puts the book down and steps out or something. And so he picks up the book. And he sees human anatomy and very descriptions of. She's learning about the birds and the bees. <laughs> so, in her okay. defense, she knew about the birds and the bees. Yeah, she knew that she knew the very basics. But it's one thing to know the basics, and one thing is to know that what you're going to be doing when you're actually participating. So, what were your guys' thoughts on it before I start going? I I frankly thought it was amazingly relatable, uh, just because. It's especially with her character where she's it's it's clear that social things don't come naturally to her. That's why she's so focused on 
how things are supposed to be done. Mm -hmm. It's because it doesn't come naturally to her. So she's always looking for templates to follow. Mm -hmm. And she's very good at following the template. It's just she's not as good at improvising. Yeah. Right. And so and this is the thing that it's love. It's supposed to be natural. Oh, you'll just understand it. And she's just like, I don't understand anything else. Why would this be different? Mm hmm. Well, especially because, you know, again, she's sort of sheltered. You know, she oh, yeah. is the she's the only acknowledged daughter of a high lord in high society. So nobody's going to talk about this with her. Yeah. Um, I, I I heard a story of of a, a of a I had a friend who was a religious leader, and she got he got a phone call one night, and it was from a girl who had just gotten married. I think I've heard this story. <laughs> and she said, I don't know what to do. And he's in the bathroom. And he's going to come out. And, it's, and the guy, poor. So I thought she poor, was in the bathroom and her, and her husband was. in. No, the, no, the it was her. It was her. Okay. And, and he was just like, I am not the person you should be calling to ask <laughs> about this. This is a conversation you should have had with your parents years ago. <laughs> yeah. And it, but it's just, you know, you, you know, when you grow up in that sort of sheltered situation and it's the kind of thing, this is the kind of thing people don't talk about mm -hmm. and sometimes they should. <laughs> yeah. There, there's lots and lots of implications and jokes and innuendo, mm -hmm. but you don't usually just go and talk about it very bluntly. I mean, it's even awkward for us now to talk about mm -hmm. it bluntly. Yeah. We're, well, heck it was even awkward for the prostitutes. Oh yeah, like they wouldn't. They're like, oh no, no, you'll just, you'll just, you'll be fine. Like as soon oh, as they honey. found out who she was, right? But it makes you wonder if they had thought she was something more like Marasi in her status compared to being the acknowledged daughter, you know. Mm -hmm. And poor Steris, or yeah. <laughs> she's like, no, I won't. Know. Just I you, need you, to you, know. <laughs> you say I'll just know. I don't know. Please tell me. <laughs> yeah, I don't care if it's awkward. Just tell me. I need to know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and I mean, that's even a thing nowadays still. Like you said with that story, Bill, about the girl. Like, yeah. Yeah, and I, I don't want to go into details on me because that's a little too personal. <laughs> but um, it was awkward for me a little bit because, I mean, it went from sex is bad and you shouldn't ever do it. And then all of a sudden, there you go. And it's like, well, that that's a big jump all of a sudden right there. In right. Expectations and how you mentally think of it and everything like that. Well, and if we go back to the first book of the series, she, um, like, she wrote into the contract l allowing for dalliances. Mm -hmm. uh, and mistresses. Yeah, if, uh, if necessary. She's always viewed it from a very impersonal mm -hmm. perspective. Mm -hmm. She's never thought about it in terms of me. What will right. I do? What do I want? Yeah. And I think it's yeah. it, I think for so long she has thought of her her wedding as a business arrangement mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. once she actually starts to you know start falling for wax a bit it becomes a bit different for her. Well, and I think that's one of the things that like one of the reasons that she actually started to fall for wax is out of everyone that she had interacted with, he's the only one who actually saw her. Yeah. You know, he noticed not just the things that she was doing, but the reasons she seemed to be doing them. And he asked her questions and realized there's something slightly different mm -hmm. and tried to interact, tried to speak to her in her own language rather than make, you know, insisting that she speak to him in his. Yeah. And, he, and he because he's willing to differences, too. And because he's willing to communicate with her like that, suddenly it's a completely different thing than she's ever experienced before. Mm -hmm. And that built their relationship. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's because if there's one thing wax likes, it's genuineness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like you, you'll notice he never hated miles because mm -hmm. miles was very genuine and he understood him yep. and you just, but he hates games. And at first he thought Steris was playing, playing the game but not not like in a in a malicious way more in a practical way mm -hmm. and now that he's gotten to know her he realizes she she isn't playing any games she's just trying to survive in a world where mm -hmm. things center around the game right and wh whereas wax's winning move is not to play as much as he can and right. tries to help her 
as far as that goes. And I thought That's that true. was interesting. Yeah. But yeah. That yeah, it was, was just it was a, like their their relationship I feel like Brandon handled so well. Mm-hmm. Because it was very, very different than most relationships you see in books like this. Well, but and I it think was... it's. Oh, I was gonna say I think it's interesting. You talk about how well he handled it. It's um, mm-hmm. it's a relationship I doubt he could have written earlier in his career. Because mm-hmm. yeah. this is like you notice, you know, Vin and Ellen, uh, Susabron and uh, and uh, oh, uh, Siri. Siri, thank you. Yes, Ser- Sereni and uh, and Rayadin. Yeah, all of them yeah. were younger loves. Mm-hmm. Where, uh, whereas this is That's true. Two people, one who has been horribly scarred by his previous relationship, mm-hmm. and another who is very new to relationships at a very late age. Well, especially mm-hmm. because Steris is one of those people who it seems like she was born at age twenty-five. And, you know, so she's been older than her years for her entire life, except in certain areas, she's very, very naive and very, very young and inexperienced. And, yeah, actually, oh, and that's another one. Uh, yeah. Godless Dalinar. Rebel points out Dalinar and Niv- uh, Navani. Oh, yeah. Their relationship is one that, you know, again, Brandon couldn't have written early in his career, but dang if he didn't nail it. He did when he, job. Yeah. Yeah, it's the type of thing where it's it's just interesting how you, you just talk about how how writers evolve and change, mm-hmm. and obviously Brandon's going through his own life, and you know he now has kids. Whereas when he wrote like a bunch of these books, he was just mm-hmm. a a starving hotel clerk. And well, like Elantris, he wrote up. before he was even married. Yeah. And so it's just very interesting watching him tackle types of relationships and friendships and 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 antagonistic ships that uh, that's totally a word. Don't look it up. Anyway, uh, just take my word for it. I, I, no, don't. No, I I I preface that. you're not allowed to look it up. Everyone has to take my word for it. It's like calling shotgun. <laughs> Driver picks the music. Shotgun shuts his cake. Yeah. Pie hole. Pie hole. Is, pie he hole. just he's tackling things that he just would <clears throat> not have touched i think mm-hmm. earlier in his career yeah and so it's it's so i just think it's really cool um oh speaking of things uh t- tackling things that he hasn't uh tackled before but we've been teased with so we finally saw the southern skadrians <laughs> yeah their their south is very different from the south that mm. i grew up in uh, yeah, just a not little enough, bit. Not enough barbecue. So the thing I love about, first of all, just their existence and their take on the Catasandra mm-hmm. was... Oh, where they see it as an apocalypse rather yeah. than a rebirth. Well, and it it, get, it it fits very well with a lot of the theme of what we see of Sezed for this entire, uh, you know, this entire era too, where we're seeing that Sezed has a tough job. And so when he moved everything, presumably, as he touched the the memories of the powers to to figure out how to do this, he would have mm-hmm. known the Southern Skadrians were down there as right. he did it. Well, and the thing that's interesting is that he did change the biologies of the Ska and the nobility again. Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, they had been differentiated when the Lord Ruler held the power. Mm-hmm. And... And Sezed put that back to normal, but he didn't put the Southern Skadrians back to normal. Maybe because he didn't realize that because they had actually evolved to become th- that way, I believe. To tolerate um, well, heat better. Like, I don't I don't believe that the Lord Ruler actually made them to the point where they tolerated heat better. Yeah. They, I think they were down in underground and then they eventually, you know, essentially evolved to prefer the warmth yeah, we don't over that thousand we don't years. know what the Lord Ruler did with them right. specifically, mm-hmm. but it's a completely different society. Mm-hmm. They, I, just, I, I found it's just it's sort of one man's trash is another man's treasure, but in reverse. 
Mm-hmm. And it's interesting how everything's backwards for them because of it. Like uh, Alec talked about how he's going to go up to hell and <laughs> mm-hmm. they must be devils because they can handle all this coldness. Mm-hmm. And it's and it's all these things that make perfect sense given given what they're they're going through down there. But right. the other thing I found interesting was how both suit and uh, whatever the, you know this. What, dang it! What tribe were they? They're the uh, the the Malwish. The Malwish. Yeah, yeah, the Mal and the Malwish both refer to the other side as barbarians and uh, <laughs> savages. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because both sides value something else. But when you go through the chapter from Marisy's perspective, when she first sees it, she thinks it's an animal because all it's dark. She can't see things. Right. And then as she starts to look, she realizes, oh, no, this is a person. And at first, mm-hmm. she sort of thinks of him as a savage because he can't speak their language. And then he stands up and she sees his clothes. And she's like, mm-hmm. those aren't savage clothes. Right. Yeah. And it's very interesting how just because she was willing to try and work through and listen instead of try and get information, Mm -hmm. they Mm -hmm. immediately learn how to fly the thing. Right. Well, and I think saving him plays a big part, too. Oh, it's oh like, yeah. yeah. You got me out of the cage. You're getting me out of the situation. Yeah, I'm going to put my trust in you a whole lot well, more than people who are doing that. one of those things. If you think that, if yeah. the set had tried... Uh... Oh, here, you, you crashed your ship. Let's give you food. Let's get you water. Let's yeah. get you all cleaned up and bandaged. Yeah, but they don't. But... They take brute force to do their what they do. Mm-hmm. Well, and they're clearly very, very yeah. racist. Yeah, just, just a smidge. Well, it's like even, like, it's... The final confrontation between Suit and uh, and Wax, he completely forgets about his Wax's his Farukami because all yeah. he thinks about is his side. Mm-hmm. The right. and it never like it's just one of those things. It's like, eh, should have thought that one through. <laughs> right. Yep. And it's just interesting how the the Malwish people look at things and how they mm-hmm. want to. They cover their faces, and they, they it's clear they have society. It's good, dancing's important, and mm-hmm. they, they talk about all these different things that we just get just a smidge of what their society is. Mm-hmm. What, one of my favorite bits is the fact that, like, when he, first off, they worship Alamancers. Yes. <laughs> but, but the fact that every compliment has to be unique. And so after a while, you see poor Alex scraping the bottom of the barrel, trying to find something, while at the same time not being wholly impressed by Wax and being kind of sarcastic. No, he got surly. (laughs) Yeah, and he, he, what is it? He talks to Maras and he's like, I'd ask him, but I think he doesn't like me. (laughs) Or he's going to get mad at me again. It's like, he's staring at me, isn't he? With those eyes. (laughs) With his eyes. And I then, and then he finds out th- he finds out that Marasi or Marasi or like, however it, that she that she <laughs> has like, well, I'm, too. I'm one too, and he's like, "All this time I've been disrespecting you. How horrible!" He doesn't say it, but you can just totally then, tell from. Well, his and then reaction. Wayne's trying to tell him, and he's like, "You know," and but it was at a time when he couldn't understand what <laughs> well, yeah, Wayne was the, saying when they had the armband off. He's like, "Oh, I'm uh-huh. one too." <laughs> and he just sort of stares at him, has like, no idea what, no he's idea what he's saying. He's yeah. like, "Why isn't he worshiping me?" And Marassi's just like, he can't understand the word you're saying. He's freezing and he's, yeah, he can't hear you. Oh. I also loved the, uh, like, there's the moment where they're they're trying to figure out how the medallions work. And, you know, Wax is, and Wax is doing things very much the same way he always would with Wayne, where they're talking something out and he proposes something. And mm-hmm. they, uh, it's something it's something simple and but he's talking it through it and the guy's like taking him as if he's taking it seriously mm-hmm. and it's just and he's like oh because oh because it was uh why don't you just put on you know 16 of them get all get you know full allomancy full farukami and it's like oh well certainly oh great one that you would you know i don't want to could tell you but if only we had thought of this it's just horribly sarcastic <laughs> for someone who's supposed to be reverent about mm-hmm. these people in some way it's i don't i want to understand why it like is it because and because brandon's a fan of this showing the the person who's not very good at being 
what their a version of yeah what they're supposed to be because we show he shows his face a lot as well and right yeah, we see from other Maoish perspectives that he they think he's too free with that right um and so but at the same time or is it or are they all like that because it's clear his captain didn't <laughs> care much for reverence either when it came mm-hmm. to wax because yeah as soon as he was like yeah no we're taking the the bands it was it was they're ready to go. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and don't get me wrong, they're both sides of this are perfectly uh reasonable in their unease with the uh, with the bands of mourning staying in the other one's power. Mm-hmm. Because from the from the southern perspective, it's like uh A, that's from our god. B, you know, you guys... just got horribly treated by mm-hmm. this you think we're going to trust you with that. And then from Wax's perspective, is like, yeah, uh, whose people came up here with a giant uh, atom bomb and <laughs> was getting ready to, you know, try and take our land and stuff? I believe you said that, that, you know, they'll see that, that this is nice that. and soft. You used and, those words. <laughs> and it's just both sides. It's like, yeah, no, uh, there's only one of these. So mutual destruction doesn't work as a, as a deterrent. And so, and so they find a neutral party. Yep, yeah. Saris is like, no, no, no. We can, we can figure out a way to not have you guys go to war. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's nice, have, uh, it's nice to have. It's nice to have Harmony's faceless immortals there. Yep, they're quite Although, helpful. Although, holy cow, Trell has them too. Yeah, I don't know what's up oh, with that. Oh gosh, that was that weird. Was it's well, so it's clear that they can copy faces, just like the Chondra can. Mm-hmm. But their eyes glow red or something. Is it right. all the time though, or is it just when they want them? That's to? what I was unclear on. Yeah, yeah. I'm you don't see them positive. very long. It's just one quick snippet with them. But it makes perfect sense uh, with Trell. He's using hemallergy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't see why he couldn't use his his metal to to make his own to make to make his own chondra. Another thing I noticed, this is and this is something Brandon has done a few times. Uh, it particularly shows in the in White Sand, but Brandon also likes to pit people, like he likes to pit skill against power. Mm. Um, and I've noticed Brandon tends to prefer skill over power um, because. Uh, so, sorry, my, my my brain went here because you're talking heme allergy, and then I immediately went to suit. And um, so because are you, you meaning like specialization? Yes, because suit has a bunch of extra abilities through hemallergy. Yep. Um, I mean, he has to switch out the spikes so he doesn't get taken over by harmony because that'll happen. harmony because exactly. But you know, for example, you have suit with all these new powers, but Wax has been using his powers since he was a child. So he's and so he's he's much master. better. He's honed them, mm-hmm. and it so it's just really interesting. You see, you know, Wax starts getting the stew beaten out of him, but he's still able to, you know, go toe to toe for a while because he knows what he's doing. And like Jordan, you mentioned earlier, the point when um, Suit forgets that Wax is also a ferrochemist. Mm-hmm. And it's just, you know, so you just see these very specialized and honed abilities. Well, and it's also because the thing that makes Suit dangerous is he is very clever and mm-hmm. he's a good read of people. And yes. we see that in the confrontation within the fake temple um, because he follows Wax down mm-hmm. and he almost falls for Wax's little trap that would have killed them both. Right, and then he's like, he pauses. He's like, and you can tell probably in his head, he's like, "We're talking too much." Mm-hmm. You're stuck. Uh, you got I me monologuing. You sly dog. <laughs> you did it. it. It was just so he's very he is very clever, but it's almost like he he has a blind spot for for certain abilities. He it's not like I don't think it's so much that he forgot that wax had um, the skimming powers Mm -hmm. i think it's more he just didn't really think that that's not that consequential because right suit doesn't 
he wouldn't he wouldn't like to do Farukabi because you have to spend time being weak to be strong and mm -hmm. and so he sort of that's not the type of investment he likes to make. Speaking of, um, and I'm trying to remember what the term they used was. That reminds me of something that was really interesting within the Malwish society was the fact that they have people who their purpose is to just give up heat to oh, fill yeah. the to fill the metal mines the the, fi the fire fathers fire fathers fi fi yeah fire familiar. fathers or fire mothers or um but Something yeah like the, but I, I just think that that's fascinating that that's sort of one of the things their society has developed is these people who their job is to to freeze <laughs> so they can to give up give so that others don't it's just it's a very interesting concept that they had to develop because if somebody wasn't w wasn't willing to do that no one they would yeah. yeah it's it's a fire mothers and fire fathers yeah. yeah thank you josh so but it's just it's a really interesting way for a society to develop because if you're in a if you are in an inhospitable land and that is a tool that has been given to you just the way that they start incorporating that into their society mm -hmm. um, I mean even you know even in the old Mistborn books it's it kind of reminds me of the uh, I forget the term that they use but for example when Tindwill was a mother and she was you know she was having children who would have Farukami mm -hmm. in their genes and it's just again you take this very very harsh situation on yourself to help your people yeah that kind of sacrifice mm -hmm. but yeah they uh that poor crew went through a lot and poor oh. Alec yeah oh boy well he seems to be doing rather well given what he went through yeah. I do find I do find it interesting that Suit and the rest of the set, they didn't take the masks from the, from the Malwish people. I would have just, for some reason, I would have assumed that that would have been one of the first things they did, is take the masks away. And I do, did find it interesting that they didn't. And then they put them on display. Mm -hmm. That's true. They probably found it more horrifying for their victims, and so they probably were like, well, let's just up the... It may have been mm -hmm. that... Well, and I guess it was also probably getting at least some sort of cooperation. It's like, well, let them keep the mask, but that also leaves it as mm -hmm. something we can take away. Yeah. So well, a little bit yeah. of leverage still. True. I hadn't really thought about it that way. So yeah, that that entire city was a house of horrors. The fact that it mm -hmm. used to be a, its own town, and then the set just waltzes in. Yeah. It's like, yeah, you work for us now. Yeah. That's disturbing. Indeed. Yeah. So we haven't. So we talked a lot about the South Scadrians. There's, there's something that we haven't talked a lot about, and it's someone we normally talk a lot about. All right. Hoyd. Hoyd. So let's talk about Hoyd. Jordan, Hoyd's, why don't you lead? So Hoyd's interactions on Scadrial are very interesting because they're less direct than is normal. Mm -hmm. This is this is the most direct he's ever taken an action on on Skadriel, I think. Um, well, okay. And I, th I think I can't remember if we talked about this in a previous episode or not, but um, timeline wise, this is a little bit after the books that have been written in the Stormlight Archive, correct? I think no, it's before, slightly before. I think it's slightly yeah. after. Uh, double check. I'm fairly certain it's before. I'm uh, fairly certain it's slightly after. I don't remember. Because at one point in the letter that Harmony writes to Hoyd, you know, in the, what are they called? The epigrams mm -hmm. in, I believe it's, I believe it's uh, Way of Kings. He, he mentions and says, yeah, that, that yeah, uh, Godless Rebel says, I think it's between book five and six. That's what I was, that's the impression I was under. Hmm. Um not but, seen the word of Brandon for it. But the he says, return to my lands and talk to me. And I think this is actually when Hoyd returns to Skadriel, returns to oh. Harmony's lands. Okay. 
could be. Well, re- regardless, um, it's very interesting because he gives him that coin, and it's that coin mm-hmm. is what sets uh, Wax on the path. Mm-hmm. Um, Absolutely. And what's interesting is because at this point, Wax is very much antagonistic towards Seized mm-hmm. um, because of what he had to go through in the previous book. Mm-hmm. And by doing this, he is sort of pointing Wax at the problem that Seized likely would have wanted him to go deal with anyway. Mm-hmm. And so it's the first time we're seeing Hoyt do something that might actually hint that he is indeed doing stuff on the behalf of, of Seized. Like, well, and he it, still clearly has his own goals, but well, and like I said, aligning. And like I said, this is one of the things that's different is, in this instance, Hoyt has been invited to, the, to a planet by the shard of that planet. Yeah, every other and one so, seems to kick him off. So you can actually kind of see, see them possibly working together. Especially because, again, the others, um, the, the other vessels knew Hoyd before mm-hmm. the Ascension, before the Shattering. Seiza didn't. Yeah. And so he's probably going to treat him slightly different than the, differently than the Shards, yeah, the vessels, would. Given Hoyd's history. personality, he does tend to grow on people, <laughs> so he needs someone who doesn't know him very well. Yep. But I found it very interesting. The other thing that's interesting, because it's not just he gave him the coin. He gave him a coin that specifically has a memory of who we're pretty sure is Kelsier, mm-hmm. uh, somehow back in the land of the living with a, with a spike through one eye, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. showing him a memory of of the South, right? Yeah, of the South, of him going to save the the Southern Skadrians. Mm-hmm. And what one thing that I I found it's it's, it's just so Brandon's so good at this stuff, uh, where he's. Because first of all, he's held the coin several times, mm-hmm. and he's never tapped, you know, the copper for the memory. It's not until he realizes what it is that he can tap the the memory, and which is brilliant from the romant, romantic theory: the fact that he has to be mentally accept what it is before he can use the power, before he Int- can even feel the power. Intent is very important in Brandon's magic system, in, in romantic. Yeah. Well, and, and not just intent, but also how you, uh, how you think of a... Perception, uh, yes. Yeah, because if, if you go to the commands that are given by the, uh, the Awakeners, yeah. mm-hmm. how they picture it in their mind is very important to access that power. Or the way that different people heal. Um, for example, the Radiance, the way they heal. Because, um, mm-hmm. again, we... When you see that, uh, spoilers for Stormlight Archive, spoilers for Stormlight Archive, three, two, one, the way that Kaladin's uh, brands don't go away because he picked, he They're... views them as a part of himself, yeah, and that and so the investiture isn't going to heal them because he's healed to to quote what he is supposed to be. It's yeah, it's part of it, his identity now, kind of. Mm-hmm. And th- but then on top of it, as he's going through that memory, he gets the impressions of the person who made the memory. And one of the things is he's going through sort of a tunnel, mm-hmm. and he's like he has an impre- like he has this impression of a bad memory or something like that of a place he's been before. And it's just like it's clearly Kelsey you're thinking about the pits, yeah, right. And it's well, okay, I shouldn't say clearly. It just. Who else can it freaking be? I don't like. It's just it has to be. Him. There's scars on the arms. Come on. Yeah, like it has to be. Him. But uh, it, it's just it's it's beautifully done as far as making it, like even though it's obvious maybe to a reader that you know he's only getting impressions. He doesn't know what they are, but the fact that the impressions right. are part of that memory, and it makes you wonder. Hoyd probably could have done any sort of thing to try and get wax on that specific trail Mm -hmm. but he gives him that coin Mm -hmm. to get him on the trail with a high likelihood that he'll experience that memory Mm -hmm. and it just it makes you wonder what is it that hoyd specifically is wanting wax to do Hmm. 
because he yeah. clearly wants him to interact with the Southern Skadrians. Well, especially because, again, this is delving a little bit into secret history. Hoyd and Kelsier don't get along. Yep. They don't like each other. Mm-hmm. And so for Hoyt now, to have... We don't, we, don't, we don't know what may happen you know, in the future. Brent, Brandon has said very, very explicitly, Hoyt and Kelsier do not get along. And if they, if they were at a dinner together, they would probably try to kill each other. But at the same time, at a dinner together is very different but, for, from not ever working together. But what what I, I'm say, what I'm saying though is that it's unusual for Hoy to have this coin. You know. Yeah, we have no clue where it came from or how mm-hmm. we got. I I would think that it's more likely that Harmony is kind of being the interloper in, in between and he's right. making sure that okay, Kelsier's doing this, and then I'm gonna have see if Hoy will do this mm-hmm. part, and then kind of balancing that and kind of mm-hmm. going in between because they don't get along. Because, yeah, they, they really do not like each other. Yeah. And so. So Josh asked the question, um, do they contain a copper mine memory that's crazy important? The so, Bands of Mourning, you mean? Oh, yes, the Bands of Mourning. Well, they very yeah. they very well could. I mean, they, they were might. made of 16 different metals. Yeah, they didn't tap memories on that, though, did they? No. I well, think technically, didn't. it says that Marassi tapped everything, but she may have been yeah. a little focused yeah. <laughs> on like everything to focus right. on. Well, yeah. and uh, that's pretty. But I think that's pretty hyperbolic for the sake right. of <laughs> being amazing. Right. Yeah. But Rule it's, of cool. it's more to the point. What what type of memory would you put into the bands of mourning? I hmm. don't. I don't know that you really would. You might. Yeah. You mm-hmm. might put the ability to do so. Um, but maybe I don't how know to, how to make it. Maybe would be an important memory, but otherwise right. I don't know. But do you memory. want do you want people to know how to make it? That's again. true. Yeah, I think it's I think at the moment it's probably safer to to not. Here's the bigger <laughs> issue. Sure, putting it on the spearhead is a very cute and roundabout thing. But is Kelsier really gonna be that dumb? I think it's it's ease of access. And I that's sort of how like I if, view if it you're as well. if you're gonna need the bands of mourning or in that diver situation, you want to be able to get them, right? Right away, not have to sit there and go. I have to go through all the traps and go through all the whole craziness to get to it. Compared to, it's right there, and it's not likely that someone's gonna go. That's the bands of mourning. <laughs> so uh-huh. you can just ease ease of access would be my thought on that. True. Why he yeah. made it the spearhead. And it would be, you know, nice and symbolic in the fact that that's what killed him. And well, because if th- that's the other thing is Kelsier, even when he's behaving altruistically, he's got an ego the size of the <laughs> entire Cosmere. Well, it's if there's one thing that Kelsier and Wax have in common is that what they're good at doing is breaking things with style. Oh, yes. <laughs> and it, with Kelsier, he does everything with style. He can't help himself. Mm-hmm. He's he he has too much of flair for the dramatic. He's far too amused with making an impression upon people. It's about showmanship. <laughs> it, it is for him, and he it is he. It's he doesn't have to be there. He can just imagine it, and that's enough for him to to get some enjoyment out of it. Mm-hmm. And you got to think. On the other hand, imagine you're Kelsier. You go to the Southern Skadrians, and they're in this horrible situation. And it's not. This is his second go around it, sort of making a religion centered around himself. And so, which again, that's not a sentence I normally say. This is my <laughs> second religion to center around myself. Yep. Um, but that's the type of man Kelsier is. That he, well, the thing he is, lives the life that where he gets to do that, some, where he gets to learn from the first time. Some people have a god complex. Kelsier. <laughs> yeah, that that's potential spoilers, so I will. Yeah, it's it's go we'll, into we'll it. get more into that in secret history cuz there's a very interesting discussion to have there especially Oh, so many good things. But the uh I just find it interesting that he they just like, "Oh no, that's a that's a challenge that he leaves for us." Mm-hmm. And I can imagine <laughs> Kelsier after the first time and getting to see how hit survivorism has evolved. I could see him being a little uncomfortable with the the 
how black and white survivorism is Mm -hmm. for for a man who lived very morally gray um survivorism itself has become very black and white Yes, and, it, although in some ways Kelsier was very black and white. Oh, I mean, he the was. Way he, the yeah. way he viewed the nobility was oh, very, yeah. very black and white. And that, now, but he grew, this is, but... Yeah, and that's the thing, is he now can view it for what it was. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think it's one of those things that he... I think he now would be very uncomfortable with how black and white it is. Possibly. Because he was very morally flexible. And, like, and, and it's something to, like... I know some people talk about the religion, how he centered it on himself. We've got to remember, he wasn't doing it to aggrandize himself. That was a great bonus as far as Kelsier is concerned, because <laughs> he does love doing that. But it was to complete a job, and mm-hmm. it had a purpose. The second time, this religion is literally to, to save people he has no attachment to whatsoever. It's yeah. far right. more altruistic than, than the first one, where... It's like, yeah, maybe he's doing this, uh, you know, for the good of, of all Ska kind. Mm-hmm. But he also has an axe to grind with the Lord Ruler. And it's mm-hmm. it's not coming from purely an altruistic place. Oh, by yeah. no means. And he's pretty upfront about that as well. So, mm-hmm. which again, sort of ingratiates you to Kelsier because it's like, yeah, he's not doing this for the good of everyone. But he told us he wasn't doing it for the good of everyone. So dang it if I don't respect that honesty. <laughs> it's true. Uh, All it's right. Just, it's just so weird. I, I can't wait for the fourth book just to find out what it was he actually did. I just I just remember, though, the very last word of this book. As soon as you read the word survive, it's just like, Dad gum it, Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing that's interesting is that apparently Brandon was planning on Kelsier surviving from the very beginning. Hmm. Um like for like it, he 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 wanted Kelsier to come back. You know, he's actually said I am very very hesitant and I don't like it. Like I, I want death to have a real consequence. Mm-hmm. And you know, he, and so he, but he also said, I knew that Kelsier's story wasn't over yet. And so he went in and he weaved hints in, and apparently there are hints all throughout, um, even this, uh, even this last book, about things that are going on beyond what we see in secret history. Hmm. So it's one of those, I want to go in and look for them, but I don't know what I'm looking for. And even if I stared right at them, I probably wouldn't see them. Speaking but, of one of those hints, not I'm, I'm transitioning away from Kels here. Well, um, not, not, not yet. Okay. Because I do want to, because th- that's the other thing that's really interesting is that from the very beginning, from the very, I think, first chapter, what has Kelsier been known as? The survivor. survivor. And, you know, so... You know, we had the survivor of Haston, and then we had uh, with Spook the survivor of the flames, and suddenly Kelsier is now the survivor of death. Something he claimed to be the first time, but it was all a lie. <laughs> yeah. But if there's anything Kelsier is able to do, it's I'm going to make myself a truth teller at least in post. Yeah. Yep. He uh, he retconned. <laughs> retconned life he retconned himself yeah that it's it's very the most interesting man in the world type stuff (laughs) he once had an awkward moment just to see how it feels Mm. yep all right so you were talking though jordan about so uh, so it was actually something you uh mentioned i think it was last episode maybe it was a couple ago um the 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 phrase rust and ruin as a Mm -hmm. As a phrase that Brandon gave, like wrote that in a person's book as a hint as to who Trell is. Right. And I was thinking about that, and I find I, I stumbled upon a, a Copper Mind article that, about Trellium, and one thing they pointed out was Trellium's coloring. Um, it has these reddish spots that look sort right. of like rust. Correct. And I'm like, ooh. Okay, because well, clearly ruin is ruin. 
like that right. makes sense but i was thinking rust and ruin a why is that a curse on like this that's not a curse they've ever said before in skadriel yeah but no, somehow but in a metal-based society though it does it, it rust makes sense but it's, it still makes it why would you say rust and ruin together mm-hmm. like that is a weird sort of phrase alliteration right. um but i've been thinking about it so this is sort of a theory I'm sort of cooking up in my head. I don't know. I don't know the extent, but I'm trying to think why would Trell come specifically to this world? We've already seen that Ruin was willing to make a deal with Harmony, or not with Harmony, with uh, Preservation, right? In mm-hmm. the the previous world, part of me is wondering if maybe he hadn't also made a deal with a diff- another shard. Trell. It's possible, and cause Ruin is planning on destroying this world because that's part of his deal with, with preservation. He'll destroy this world. Mm -hmm. And so part of me wonders if what Trell actually is, is some other shard that Ruin made a deal with. And because he got destroyed, never followed through on the deal that Ruin sort of broke the promise Mm -hmm. by dying. And I'm wondering if maybe Trell is coming to collect that's possible. And that might be why Rust and Ruin is a thing. That it's something that Trell has slowly seeped into the world because mm. that's the pairing in his mind. I had a deal with Ruin. Mm-hmm. Hmm. I, I don't like know. it's 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 a it's a stretch. I don't want to pull anything stretching that far. Right. But I just feel like there's something there. And it would be an interesting concept because Ruin that was sort that was his whole his whole problem with the uh, with preservation that preservation broke the deal mm-hmm. and he was coming to collect I was promised a, dis- a destruction of a world and yeah hmm. now it's that that chicken's coming home to roost in, but in a completely different form because while the power of ruin mm-hmm. may have made that deal Sezed's a very different uh, yeah. animal. I'm I'm not sure. That'll, yeah, that'll I be mean, there's way too many details that we don't right. know. Yeah. That, that, that's a bit of a stretch a... at this point. I mean, you you may very well be right, but I'm. I yeah. mean, we we have no clue. So, I just I'm trying. To, why is that a hint? Why is Rust and Ruin a hint? And so, <laughs> yeah, I'm trying and... to think of all the ways that Rust could be Trell, and the fact that his metal is sort of rust colored. Right. It's an interesting juxtaposition. Mm-hmm. No, and that's something that people have brought out. Um, on that note, it's probably time to start wrapping up. Um, oh, yeah, uh, we will probably want to start wrapping up. So, uh, of course, as always, we want to thank our patrons. Y'all are the ones who make it possible for us to keep making new episodes. Uh, the show, of course, will continue to be free for everybody. But if you want to support us, even with a buck or two per episode, uh, go to patreon.com slash Cosmere Studies. When you become a patron, you will get immediate access to our Discord channel where we've got a community growing, people chiming in, letting us, you know, giving us feedback on the episodes, posing their own theories. Um, And you can take part in that discussion about the Cosmere, about the show, um, as well as uh, bonus content that we've got, like the 6-7, which is a collection of seven pieces of content we find each episode. And we want to share those with you because... We're nerds. We find stuff that entertains us. And what's the first thing that a nerd wants to do when they find something they like? Make everybody else see the same thing and love it as much as they do. Because that's what we do. Mm -hmm. And, of course, if we make any bonus content, you'll also get early access to that. Um, Beyond that, our patrons are automatically going to be entered into our giveaways once we start doing those again. Um, To clarify, those giveaways are not exclusive to patrons. They are free for anybody to enter the patrons will just be entered automatically. They don't have to do anything uh, extra, but anybody else will be able to enter those, of course. And of course you help us to continue to make the show and improve the quality of our episodes. As we get more patrons, we're hopefully going to be able to make episodes more often. Um, As you've seen, we're investing in new equipment. So, and that's partly due to the support that we've gotten from our patrons as well. Um, we are hoping to improve the video quality and audio quality even more as possible. So anything, you know, and all of that is 
possible because of our patrons. So thank you so much for your generosity. Um, it's because of you that we're able to keep making content. Now, from time to time, we get questions from our listeners about the Cosmere and other topics, and we like to address them during the show whenever we can. This week, Josh, who happens to be in the chat room, has posed a question for us. Jordan, do you have that up in front of you? I do not, actually. You do not. Um, all right, I'll read it this time. He says, hey, all nothing too big this week. However, I did come up with a hypothetical situation to think about. Picture a skimmer ferrochemist like Wax becoming a windrunner. Think of how much stormlight they could save by lashing and then reducing their weight by filling their metal mind as opposed to lashing multiple times. It theoretically could give a massive, massive speed boost. Like I said, nothing too big, but I think it's an interesting concept. Mixing lashing with weight manipulation would be like having a, a course adjustment, uh, C-O-A-R-S-E, as well as a fine adjustment, creating excellent control, not unlike Zane with his enhanced steel pushing abilities. Thanks for what you three do. Also, thanks for the response and, you know, sign Josh. Josh, first off, we appreciate you joining us in chat today. And uh, Josh has actually posed a few questions to us in emails. And so and they're really good conversation points. But what do you all think about this? I've got so bad news for you, Josh. <laughs> I will read straight from a word of Brandon discussing this very uh, this very topic. This is what oh, I had dear. prepared instead of the actual question because I do things backwards. <laughs> uh, Jordan doesn't uh, want to read the question. He just wants to destroy hopes and dreams. It's more I bookmarked the wrong thing. Anyway, um, <laughs> no, this was from the Shadows of Self release party. And so uh, someone named Cly Guy asked uh, if wax were to go to roshar and he's a skimmer right so he could change his weight if he got lashed in a different direction if he stored his weight would that nullify some of the lashing which is sort of what we're discussing here mm -hmm. and brandon said okay you're gonna make me think through this and then he laughs so at least brand you're at least already on the harder question for him brandon then says so wax actually changes mass and the lashing only affects gravitational pull so the answer is no, because different things with different masses fall at the same speed. Now, that said, you would be able to stop better in the air if you were a skimmer, because by reducing your mass, you would increase the effect of wind resistance on you. Mm -hmm. And so I do think it would improve your ability to stop. But it wouldn't be you wouldn't be able to get a speed boost out of it. You could only get a mm -hmm. deceleration boost out of it, which in a fight is still quite useful. Yeah. Right. You imagine the that the fights they were having in the air with Kaladin, you know, facing off against people. It's, you know, stopping and starting is a very valuable tool. Mm -hmm. That's true. But it uh yeah, I got really excited as well and started thinking things and started trying to come up with things. And of course you did. It's physics. Well, it's very... <laughs> and skimmers are the most bizarre one, okay? Because mass... He says they store mass, and this bugs me on several levels. Because mass is the act... So in, in general, <laughs> mass is the measure of a resistance to change. The more massive something is, the more it doesn't want to give up its heat, the more it doesn't want to you know, move if it's stopped... It doesn't want to stop if it's moved. And that's what mass does. What they're actually storing isn't, in my opinion, mass. It's the it's the inertial component of mass. Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't affect how they give up heat or anything else that is affected by mass. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. it's it's bizarre. Uh, it, but, yeah, but lashings... Because mass is dealing with inertia, whereas... The lashings deal with gravity itself, which is also just breaks so many things. But Br Brandon has made it for the most part internally consistent until you deal with red shifting and time bubbles, and that shouldn't work. But uh, magic, a wizard did it. Yeah, at a certain point, I, a wizard I did guess, it. But Brandon, I guess unfortunately, a god did it in this case. <laughs> yeah. In this case, Brandon has sort of shot this this question down. And so he ruined things because things were going to be fun and we're going to break things. But I guess Brandon has to worry about game balance when uh, he has an end game in mind. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, that's why he now has a t- team keep to help him keep track of everything. <laughs> but I like that Brandon at least has to still think about these things, uh-huh. mm-hmm. even though he's the creator of the system. Well, and there are sometimes people pose questions to him, and he's like, okay, I'm going to say something. You cannot take this as undisputable gospel because I may change it later on. This is not canon. <laughs> this is what I'm thinking right now. Mm-hmm. And I like, but I like that he is very clear about this kind of thing. He's like, okay, what I'm going to say right now, this is almost as much speculation on my part as the same way that you do. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, who knows? Maybe, maybe by the end of this, he'll change his mind and mass will be what I want. And I can get the crazy theory I wanted where they could store the direction of the lashing essentially. But, uh, <laughs> It, it, so it does lead to what my big question is, which is you lash someone and then you somehow get them onto Skadriel and then you lash them again. But don't ask how we got the spren over there to where they can do this because everything's gravitational. Would it, if, if you lash them up on, on Skadriel, do they move away from Skadriel or do they just move away from Roshar since it's up relative to Roshar. <laughs> I don't these are the things that keep me up at night. <laughs> Not me. Okay, I love I love your comment uh in the chat. He says Brandon will be the best DM. Yes. Okay, so that is kind of one of our dreams because <laughs> one of our stretch goals is eventually to run a campaign of the Mistborn Adventure game. And I'm like, if, if we get high enough, what do you think it would take to convince Brandon to DM a game for us? <laughs> Probably a lot. Yeah. So I think it simultaneously would be a lot more than we'll ever get. But it also might be less than we'd think because Brandon might want to do it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, no. Anyway, but so... Yeah. But yeah, that brings us back to patrons. Uh, Just saying, guys, it's Christmas, and uh, if you found a lot of entertainment, just saying, you know, happy holidays to the Six Crew could be uh, just a good way to spend the holidays. I mean, I don't want to, you know, put gift ideas into your head, but I'm thinking, no, one or two dollar. And uh, speaking of the holidays, speaking of the holidays, we're only eight days away from Kolos Head Munching Day. That's right, and we'll be sending out uh, to those of you who were kind enough to. to give us uh what was it five dollars right a five dollar yeah a five dollar at some point in the year didn't need to be forever just at some point Mm -hmm. you'll be receiving uh coloss head munching day cards from us yes absolutely um but the other thing is you know what else happens on coloss head munching day oh the state of the sanderson so i'm really that's that's the big that's the big reason we told you guys of when we're uh broadcasting next because even though it'll come out after the state of Sanderson will have recorded it before. Oh, so exactly. So if you tune in on uh, box, the box boxing day is the day after Christmas, right? Yes. Yes. It will be yeah. on boxing day. If you turn tune in on boxing day, hoping to hear our reaction to it. Uh, it's not, not bad news for you. Yeah. That said, if you tune in to the episode after that, we might have some discussion. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, so again, thanks uh, thanks for writing in, Josh. Uh, if you have questions or feedback for us, we'd love to hear it. Let us know what you think of the show. Let us know what your favorite moments from the Cosmere have been. Let us know if we said something ridiculous that made you laugh out loud. We probably said something ridiculous. I don't know how much you were going to laugh or not. But if you did, let us know because we like hearing that we're funny. Um what have you been wanting us to talk about? You know, what we've got a bunch of books coming up. I believe after Secret History, we'll be discussing The Emperor's Soul. So if there's something in either of those two books that you want to make sure that we talk about, send us an email and let us know. We'll try to devote some time to that topic as well. Um, is there something that we missed in one of the books we've already talked about? Let us know that. What theories do you have these are the the questions that what questions keep you up at night we know what's keeping jordan up at night but what's keeping you up at night and how can we help to give you a little bit of rest and and sleep if you have any questions for us email us at cosmere studies at gmail.com and we just might read and discuss your email in an upcoming upcoming episode 
Now we've each got our own personal projects. Uh, so Jordan, where can we find you and what is going on in your world? Uh, you can find me at twitch.tv slash splice stream. Uh, the new smash game just came out smash ultimate. Um, we just had our big charity event that we talked about last time. And I just want to give a thank you to, to all you who came. It was 12 hours. It was a marathon. If my voice sounds scratchy, it's because it happened two days ago. And streaming for 12 hours is rough on the old vocal cords. But it was an epic event. Um, The goal was $512. And heading into our last event, we hadn't even reached half of that. But by the end of the night, we were at $904 on the backs of so many hot wings that I (laughs) agreed to eat when people gave a certain amount and suddenly people were very giving <laughs> because I was going to be in pain, which I don't know if that says something about me, my fans, or both. But uh, So maybe one of our next Patreon stretch goals is Gor- Jordan gets hit in the head with a crowbar. I don't know. No. Let's not do the... I mean, the cro- That's permanent mean, damage. <laughs> is it? But um, A Nerf crowbar. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> I can make a foam but, one. No, seriously, in, in, all, in all honesty, it was an amazing event. Um we, we were able to give a lot more to charity than I originally had hoped. And even though I was suffering on stream and uh, 24 hours later uh, dealing with the consequences of eating mango habanero wild wings, uh, it was it was definitely worth it. We're going to have to do it again sometime. But uh, we're, it's back to sort of our normal schedule. I'll be, uh, I'll be streaming Amiibo content and the training thereof here soon because we are in a brand new wild world of Smash Ultimate and it's going to be fun. All right. And Amy, how about you? Me? I am on social media stuff. I am on Facebook as Coincidence Cosplay and Props. Twitter as at Coincidence Cosp because my name is too long. And my Instagram is Coincidence underscore Cosplay. And I have mostly been doing friend gifts right now and other things. I made some poison apples from Snow White for my friend who does the Evil Queen. And I made Jordan. Do you have your guy? Oh, yes, I do. <laughs> that is amazing. I it's made the ghost 3D, bed. guys. It's 3D. I didn't design it, but I printed it and finished it. So so for those for the audio only listeners, she was very nice and uh, <laughs> made uh, alongside her husband a, uh, a Ghostbusters 3D logo for me. With the ghost reaching out, he's 3D and going for you. For, for those for those of you who don't know, Ghost, Ghostbusters is Jordan's favorite movie. Period. Yeah, it's uh, a <laughs> it's true north on my moral compass is Ghostbusters. <laughs> so anyway, so I so yeah, I've been making gifts and whatever else and stuff like that. So I've been doing as much cosplay stuff, but and I'm gonna work on some D20s, those plush ones, and then I think I'll get back to the not school. <laughs> but Christmas yep. is rough that way. She made me a Star Wars apron, and it made me happy. It's like, it's like, um, oh, how do you describe it? R2-D2-A-T-H-E like walkers. Uh, it's, like ugly, it's like almost ugly sweater style in a way. <laughs> but yeah, I saw that fabric and was like, oh, oh, that's Bill right there. I'm getting that. <laughs> so, so you saw ugly fabric and you thought it's of Bill? It's cute. It's cute. Okay. I like it. <laughs> I'm the ugly fabric of the podcast. <laughs> What is my life? (laughs) All right. And as for myself, we were when you picked us up. (laughs) Technically, we recruited her. (laughs) Don't focus on that. That that kind of ruins my narrative here. Uh, As for myself, when I'm not here, I'm writing board game reviews over at the Innkeeper's Table at www.innkeeperstable.com. If you want to find me, I've got... um, a few social media channels as well on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. It's at Innkeeper's Table. If you have enjoyed the show, uh, we would really love it if you would go to iTunes and give us a five-star review over there. Um, like the videos, share them with people. Uh, it really makes a big difference in bringing in new listeners. Next to becoming a patron, it's the best way to support us. And again, sharing the show with other people, the audio or video versions Um, other people who enjoy Brandon Sanderson's stuff. We would just love for you to spread the word. Now, before we close the episode, Amy and Jordan, do you have any final thoughts about the bands of mourning and what we've discussed tonight and last episode? Um, I thought I was going to go a lot more like super feminist on this episode, but I didn't end up doing that. (laughs) 
I had like a huge amount of text that I was going to talk about because my I wrote the show notes or a lot of them and I just kind of went like my brain went off the deep end. Um, <laughs> but I, I did really appreciate how Brandon made sure to have consent be a big thing. Like even mm-hmm. when after Wax proposes like for real and like says, yeah, let's go ahead and do the ceremony. And then says, but we, we don't have to, you know, do anything tonight or whatever, because it's been a long day. And I really appreciated that he wasn't just like, so we're married now, let's let's go, you know, compared to if you're tired, you know, we can, this is both right. of us, so we both agree on things. So, anyway, well, I like that. They, they really do have a partnership in their relationship, mm-hmm. which is really cool. Yeah, like, just, I loved rereading parts of that, that scene on the mm-hmm. train after the awkwardness where he finds her reading the book. Right. It's a really good scene. And then they immediately afterwards find Wayne and Milan making out in the that, No, that's, that's later. That's later. That's after the gunfight. It's after the fight, right? Yeah, because there, well, there's that. that and then Marassi I mean. finds him with doing the accounting and then right, gunfight. Right. And then, then the the illicit out. accounting affair. Oh. <laughs> Steris, we are in public. <laughs> All right, Jordan, are you going to about... derivate those numbers like that? <laughs> Uh, uh, my final my final thought was simply survive and mm. the fact that we'll be covering I don't know if it's my favorite Brandon work in secret history but as far as Brandon works go it is the rare steak of Brandon's work <laughs> it's juicy and it's delicious yeah just the line survive mm. and we're just like oh Oh, there's oh, more. Oh, there's oh. so much more. <laughs> it's almost like there's another secret. There's always oh. another secret. See what I did there. I, I see exactly what you did. Oh, good. All right. <laughs> okay. Well, in addition to the live episodes of the show that stream on twitch.tv slash innkeepers table every two weeks on Monday nights at 7.30 p.m. Pacific time, 10.30 p.m. Eastern, our listeners can find the video versions of our podcast on YouTube or audio versions on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, and just about anywhere else that you find fine podcast content. Just search for Cosmere Studies. You can also follow us and contact us through Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under the profile at Cosmere Studies. Our next episode will be released on our normal schedule, just as a reminder, which is two weeks from Wednesday, which that will be on December 26th, Boxing Day. But we're actually going to be recording it a bit early. So if you want to join us during the, the live recording to chat, you can go to www.twitch.tv slash innkeepers table at 8, at 8.30 p.m. this Sunday, December 16th. We will finally be diving into one of Jordan's favorite b- uh, pieces by Brandon, Mistborn's Secret History. In the meantime, on behalf of Amy, Jordan, and myself, thanks for listening. And remember, there's always always another another secret. secret.